Welcome to Relentless Truth with John Warren, the podcast that extracts truth from a wide range of topics, revealing who God is, who we are, and how we relate to each other. Now, here's John with this week's powerful and practical insights. Welcome to Relentless Truth. I'm John Warren. It is good to be with you. Please like, share, review, and subscribe to Relentless Truth. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Go to johnwarrenmedia.com for more information. Contact us there using the contact form or email me at john at johnwarrenmedia.com. My guest today is a very special guest. He's well known to many of you. Dr. Keith Ablo is a graduate of Brown University and the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He practiced psychiatry for over 25 years before developing his own groundbreaking life coaching, mentoring, and spiritual counseling program, Pain to Power. Expanding on the Pain to Power pathway, Keith offers creative coaching for writers, artists, inventors, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. He's helped thousands of adults and adolescents across the country in Europe and in Asia, including CEOs, elected officials, professional athletes, and world-renowned artists. His 16 books have sold millions of copies and been translated into eight languages. He co-authored the New York Times bestselling self-help book, The Seven Wonders, as well as authoring Living the Truth, Transform Your Life Through the Power of Insight and Honesty. He's a sought-after speaker and has appeared over 1,000 times on the Today Show, Oprah, Good Morning America, the Fox News Channel, CBS This Morning, Inside Edition, and many other national television programs. His writings have been published by USA Today, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The New York Post, Good Housekeeping, Discover, and Newsweek. Keith, pardon the long introduction. There's a lot to say there, but welcome to the podcast. It's an honor to have you here. John, thank you. It's uh, I'm honored to be here. Well, I'm wondering if you'd take a couple of minutes and just tell the listener of Relentless Truth your story how you grew up, how you got to this point. I've had the pleasure of having a couple of conversations with you in recent years, and I think our listeners are familiar with your work, but would enjoy learning more about who you are. Well, thanks. I hope so. And, you know, hey, it's my favorite topic. Just kidding. But, <laughs> you know, my critics would say so. But in any case, listen, I uh, think the best way to understand what I've been up to for the past, you know, 35 years or something is very interested in narrative and story. And I have something of a sixth sense for when stories ring true and for when they don't quite ring true. And uh, it's been a passion of mine to bring them closer to the truth. Hence, you know, it's a great thing for me to be on Relentless Truth with John Warren because it's what I care about. And it doesn't matter. The venue for that has been multi-faceted. So when I write novels, and I've done that, Picasso said, all art is a lie that tells the truth. Mm. When you write novels, you have to create characters that ring true. They have to have backstories that explain what they're doing now. The past has to set the stage in a human way that we can all empathize with for the decisions that they're making today. Similarly, if you help people individually, as I have endeavored to do as a therapist, as a life coach, as a psychiatrist, what you're really doing is you're giving them back themselves Mm -hmm. to the extent that you can, because people do quite well when they are possessed, self-possessed. They do much less well if they feel like they're not in the driver's seat of their own existence because they've left parts of themselves behind. And in business, when I help people start businesses or I consult to leaders, it's the same thing. It's, listen, you've got this narrative going about this company you want to start or this effort that you're making politically, but I don't feel like the storyline is cohesive and feels solid and true. There are some outlying facts that aren't consistent. Mm. with what you're, I think, attempting to say. When you get it right, though, as a person, you find you make fast friends. 
right? If you, if you know who you are and you're willing to say it, you can form incredible relationships, not just with yourself and with, you know, the infinite, if you will, or God or the universe, but with other people. Usually that's about connecting around the things that people tend to jettison or bury, the things we empathize with. And when you get it right with art or literature, it's because you've constructed something mm. that people say, yeah, I get it. So that sort of, you know, that word like, yup, I get, yup, I get it. I get myself. I get you. Whatever it is, that's been what I've been striving for. And it's probably because in my own life experience, like every person, you know, there were some truths, some half truths and some coming to terms with both <laughs> that becoming an adult involved right. and uh, it's a lifelong journey really. So that's a little bit about me um, and it kind of hopefully set the stage for our discussion because it's really what I care about is, listen, let's just get to the core truth and things actually will unfold pretty well from there. You know, one part of your story that I don't know is uh, how did you, you, you've had a lot of media appearances and, and I'm wondering how did you go from, you know, the, the psychiatry practice to being this guy, the media relies on for a lot of input. And I'll, I'll just blurt out the fact that you come across just the way you described yourself, uh, your aspiration just a moment ago, because I find myself, this conversation is just a personal treat for me because I've appreciated the, those media appearances because I find myself thinking, I wonder if he's going to respond to this. And then in the next breath, you say it. Um, no, and, that's kind. And, Thank you. Buddy. And I, I'm sure they, they, the producers or whoever it is who figured out one day, Hey, Keith Ablow is good at this. I'm sure they appreciate that too, or you wouldn't get all these opportunities. But how did how did you go from got my head down working with patients and clients to uh, the media noticing you? Well, you know, I think it started. I've always had one foot in something related to medicine and healthcare, and one foot in writing. And so, even back in med school, I started writing a column for the Washington Post about my experiences going through Johns Hopkins. Mm. Some of them were you know, uh, wonderful. Some were lacking. Um, I, I didn't think that we were really uh, being trained in, in things uh, more human. I thought we were kind of being trained to suppress our humanity mm. in service to anatomy, for instance. And so I did some writing about that and writing about some folks that I met in the ER and elsewhere with disguising who they were, changing a few characteristics. So from there, as I was doing my work as a psychiatry resident, I continued to offer some insights to the media. Uh, I started getting invited on to talk shows, other people's talk shows. Uh, and, you know, I'd lend what I could uh, to the discussion. I, I started writing books about psychiatry. And so mm -hmm. I was able to provide some expertise. I think the reason that they had me back is that, I wasn't comfortable on the surface of things. And so I didn't take a traditional path and I don't take a traditional path with either clients or with interviews or being interviewed. I really try to say while doing them, wait a sec, what's this feeling I have inside about this, this guest or this topic Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to be really truthful. So even, you know, when I was on Fox News as a contributor, I was there 10 years or whatever. And I remember since Fox is a conservative network, they were very excited when John Edwards had a baby with his videographer outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. And they figured we're going to crucify this guy. Let's have Ablo on and he'll say what this does to a marriage and how his character must be so dark. And what I said was, you know, I think I'm going to have to meet the little girl when she's, say, 40. Because if she's preparing to run for president uh, and is elected the first female president, this love child of John Edwards, I'm going to feel really stupid if I completely decimate him in this segment. They're like, what? I said, look, he's a human being. I don't understand. 
for some reason, he gave away his presidential ambition. He sacrificed it. He blew up his marriage in order to have this relationship. I don't, I can't judge it. I don't know, but there was a lot of energy in it. Mm. And I, I, I'd say the jury's out. And so I try to just be honest. And um, from there, by the way, I had an experience where I had written some scripts and I'd sold one, a drama series, a pilot. And that didn't go beyond the pilot. So I went back out to Los Angeles with my agent and he said, we we're at lunch. He said, you know, we're right across from Warner Brothers. Why don't we walk in and ask him, you know, whether you'd be good for a talk show? I said, oh, come on, Greg, I've just spent a year on a script that just became a pilot and nothing more. I don't want to embarrass myself walking in like a lunatic saying, I think I should have a talk show. So, you know, we finished a second cup of coffee, he looked at his watch. He said, you know, we still get 40 minutes to kill. How about if we walk over there? So he said, oh, I'm like, gee, okay, fine, let's do it. Anyhow, we ended up signing a contract for the talk show that I ended up doing uh, for Warner Brothers. And I think there's a lesson in that, that sometimes you got to listen to when things are aligned and be willing to say, huh, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess we are across the street. Let's go. Yep. Well, I, there's a lot there in everything you just said to unpack. I agree with your assessment of Fox News, and I see their their value and also see the piling on from time to time. And that's exactly what I was talking about when I said that you, you always handled the topic well, whether you're on a conservative or more uh, left-leaning or even moderate network. But one of the things you you talk a lot about is fear and you know the i guess i'll say it this way the older i get the more experienced i get the more i realize what a role fear plays in all of us you actually said on your website you talk about this anxiety and depression alarm system and i i don't want to get us off track but I, i'm wondering if you could just talk about current um, events a bit over the last few years with the political environment, COVID, all the tension over over social issues, uh, uh, and now Russia invading Ukraine. All of this uh, sort of combines to give me the impression that the world is kind of in a funk. And I see fear and tension everywhere, much more prolifically than in normal times, knowing you can't solve the world's fear in you know those challenges in a podcast episode. But would you just talk about what you see when you observe people dealing with this environment today? Well, uh, yeah, I can. And, you know, I think it goes back to what we talked about sort of at the top of the hour, which is that people do best when they are possessed of themselves. Under a lot of pressure, people can be pushed away from center. They become off center. And so they're in a survival mode and they feel like, oh my God, I got to catch these 17 balls. There's no way I'm going to be able to do that. And God knows, God knows what's going to happen next and anything could. And what will that mean for my money? What will that mean for my family? What will that mean for the world? You know, I can't solve that in a podcast, but what I can suggest is that it never fails, it turns out, and I'm 60 it now, so, you know, I've had some time to be panicked myself and think whether it made any sense in, in retrospect. I'm right there. Much, I'm right there with you chronologically, <laughs> right? just, just so you know. So we got two 60-year-old guys, Keith Avalo and John Warren, talking to each other here, and you might agree, but you'd have to tell me, my thought is that now I tend to look at everything and say, huh, I wonder what's going on here, and how this will be engineered toward the good. Because I think that, in fact, things tend toward the good. And even when there's chaos, there's always something to reap from it. So we would have said, uh, what good can possibly come of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? What possible good could come of it? And I think any one of us would say we'd be tempted to write that chapter out of history books, have it never happen. Now, that's, I suppose, understandable. 
But we'd also have to say, huh, okay, so there's this guy who inexplicably, Zelensky, comes to represent courage, grace under pressure, a commitment that's almost inexplicable. Unbelievably. To, right? Unbelievably. Unbelievably to defending yeah. his country and saying, hey, I'm here. Now, we don't know how many people, young people, are inspired by that example, what role they'll play in the world in the future, uh, how his bravery might destabilize some countries, including Russia, uh, where democracy isn't in force. And so you'd look at it from the beginning and say, oh, my God, they're going to be decimated. It's going to be over. Ah, You know what? We had to wait it out. The future defines the past. And if people can kind of lean into things and say, if if nothing else, this tumult, this chaos in my own life, let's say it's in your own life, what does it offer me? Well, at minimum, the opportunity to confront it head on with your head held high and say, you know, my kids are watching me. Uh, My loved ones are watching me. Maybe some other people are watching too. And the way I conduct myself, that could be a gift to others, including, you know, your kids, you, you confront adversity, illness, God forbid. And you could say, well, I didn't want it, but it sure does look like an opportunity to show strength under pressure and tell people I love them, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such good perspective. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm struck by this wisdom and discernment that you just talked about, you, and you did so in the context of aging uh, or your age, and I think those life experiences are so valuable. My work is, as you know, kind of half financial and economics related and about half focused on theology and philosophy, and I'm able, after many years in banking, for example, to see patterns in organizations and in the economy. It's just it becomes easier over time to see that that next layer, as you just said it, that next layer of thinking. I'm wondering, you obviously see these patterns in people, and you talk about that a lot. Would you comment on a few of the, I call them in the business world, common threads that you see in terms of the way people deal with, say, fear poorly or anxi- sure. anxiety poorly? Yeah, I think... Uh- First, there are people who deal with it well, and there are people who deal with it less well. And by the way, you're a great interviewer, because (laughs) this is really getting to the core, right? So I I actually sat down. I'm a hacker who's trying really hard. (laughs) No, Well, you, you make it look easy. But the truth is that people do take stress and trauma. Uh, And no one can be criticized for, of course, for taking it hard because people are people, people are human. The folks who take it most hard, first of all, almost nothing that occurs once you're, say, 20 years old or 30, certainly 60, is just related to the moment. Most things will echo deeply and bring up things from the past. And so if you find yourself anxious, worried, feeling you know buried by circumstance, it's not just today. It's, a, it's definitely a sign that you'd be wise to dig deeper, dig deep, and find out, well, when prior to this did I feel powerless and did things turn in a negative way for me Suddenly, if you start looking into your backstory, you're going to find out why in the present moment you're taking things like a ton of bricks have hit you. Mm -hmm. And some of these things do feel like a ton of bricks, but they feel even weightier for some of us than for others. And so that's one lesson that I've definitely learned. Most of us live our lives as though we're, you know, if someone said, hey, you know what I'd like you to do? Read the first uh, 30 pages of this book, then go to page 210 and finish to the end, page 400. You'd say, man, I mean, you're having me skip a whole bunch of chapters here that are glued together. I feel unsteady. I feel confused, lost. 
Well, that's unfortunately the way a lot of us live our lives is we never look back at those chapters that are glued together. Very often, that's where some of the richness could come from because we have bound up power there. That's where the whole pain to power thing came from to begin with, what I call pain to power, because basically if you can do it, if you can go back and say, man, I experienced these things as an 11, 12, 7, 15-year-old, And I was ill-equipped to deal with the loss of my dad's business or the house burning down or the fact that we moved 11 times or the fact that my grandmother, who I loved so much, died. You register these things and you're like, oh, my God, I've just been bowled over and I'm only 11. And it's unthinkable. You store it away. And then when something else comes up in the present moment, it brings that back up as a threat because it hasn't been processed. But if you can go back and process it, you then reap all this treasure, insight. You grieve, perhaps, but it's behind you. And now you can look forward and move decisively into the next chapter of your life story. You know, I'd say the other folks, you know, there are many people who have, who feel unstable in the face of uncertainty also because so many of us struggle with anxiety and depression chronically. It's epidemic. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you add on a couple bricks and people feel like, well, that that's the, you know, straw that breaks the camel's back because people are already running on empty and you tell them, hey, you know, X percent more of your income is going to go to gasoline and food and inflation's rising. And anyhow, they're not sure if there's a new variant of the virus. And people say, I, I, I feel dizzy. I feel like I'm going to faint from the, the number of variables I can't control. No, the only thing you can control is you mm. and your response to circumstances. You know, I used to have a, a line that I would summon to mind when something would go wrong, you know, that at another time in my life would have you know, had me taking uh, time on the couch and, you know, trying to nap through it, right? But uh, <laughs> not anymore because now if someone says, well, you know, this deal's not happening or this project has stopped or, man, you, you've really angered someone uh, or uh, we get to follow up on this test, this medical test, anything like that, I, I tend to summon this line that I generated when I was younger and my kids were younger, which was, I would, I would say it in my mind, not out loud. I would say, ah, yeah, but you're not a pediatrician. Mm. By which I meant, look, I know what would have me not thinking one second about this deal or this friendship gone awry or anything like that or all these other things that are laying me low. It's the call from the pediatrician, God forbid, right? that your kid's battling something terrible. Yep. And then nothing matters. It's like, ah, nothing matters. So in a sense, it's like everybody's doing better than they think because we are so afraid to imagine terrible, terrible tragedy. We don't want to think about our own deaths. We don't want to think about the deaths of loved ones. And so we can take things harder than we really need to. Cause the truth is give it a month, give it three months, give it six months. You'll look back and you'll say, I can't believe I went through that, but I did. Mm. You know, I, I draw strength from a, it's really interesting because almost to the day it's 18 years ago, I woke up from a colonoscopy at age in my early forties to hear that I had a uh, stage three colon cancer. So everything you're saying is resonating with me. I I had never really experienced anxiety before. I mean, I had experienced sort of passing anxiety like, like most people do, but never this level where I think it was three days I didn't sleep. And Mm. not only did I not sleep, I, I paced around the house and I had never really contemplated as much theology as I knew and as much um, Mm. wisdom as I thought I had. I, I hadn't really appropriated it. I hadn't really uh, thought about it in in that context. So every word you just said resonates with me. I'm, and I know these are processes that we're talking about. And you can't, you know, just get a person in in a five minute comment to uh, deal appropriately with negative issues in our past. But 
that seems to me among my friends, among my students, among uh, their parents and, and folks I know even associated who will respond to a podcast episode to give me a little bit of encouragement. I, I think a common theme among us fallen people on this earth is dealing with negative issues, negative issues from our past. Can you talk just just a couple more minutes about that? Is that is it true that most people struggle with that? And when you say process it, uh, does that mean I'm kind of tying together some themes that I hear from you? Does that mean be honest about it? It actually happened and kind of come to grips with it, or could could you just give that a little more color? Sure. And then you know maybe you'll tell me what you were thinking about as you were pacing. Oh my goodness! I, I, it was not coherent thought. It was regrets. My daughter was five years old. Our only child, daughter. Am I going to see her graduate? Am I gonna? Am I going to get to walk her down the aisle someday? I planned to be around for a long time, and I hadn't received the pathology from. I hadn't even had surgery yet, so I hadn't received the pathology. So I didn't know what my prognosis was, am I going to die in two weeks, uh, a year, or live a normal life? And so it was kind of all of that. Totally. I, I totally, I mean, overwhelming, right? Oh, like, and, like like I can't even convey with words. Yep. Yeah. And so uh, there's a connection actually between that and what we're talking about in terms of, yes, I think it's everybody, not just most people. But everybody needs to go through a process where they reclaim parts of themselves they've left behind. What are those parts? It's not the trophies you got. It's not uh, the celebrations. It's not all the fun times on vacation. Generally, what people need to reclaim are the tough times and all of the worry, angst, sadness, and anxiety that went along with them that got buried and did not get thought through, no one commiserated fully with the experience. And therefore, the things we bury, they don't stay underground comfortably. They multiply underground. Mm. They become more powerful, kind of like if you had a boiling pot with a lid on it. If you experienced the loss, I'm just going to pick something almost trivial, but you know, it's not trivial. You know, the loss of your dad's business and a change in your circumstances when you were eight and you saw the worry in your parents' face and you know that you moved and you had to leave a neighborhood because you didn't have the dough to stay. Well, you know, it might be, believe it or not, that 30 years later, when you're introduced to a wonderful partner that you might start a wonderful business with, you stop short, you panic. And why are you panicking at the dawn of something potentially great? Well, because in your history, it wasn't great for your dad. You know, someone stole from him. It resulted in all kinds of financial calamity for your family. And you're unconsciously thinking, you know what? Uh, business equals bankruptcy. And I can tell you, it might be an hour or two hours, not a month, two or five years for a talented therapist, life coach, psychiatrist to dig deeply and say, well, wait a sec. You just told me how your dad lost his business. Whoa. How did that play out for you? What happened? Mm. Well, this happened, that happened. And well, and how do you figure this will end for you if you go forward with the business? So it all ends up, the things that we try to turn our back on end up in front of us, anxiety-wise. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've spoke, and, and so it's everybody, by the way, and, and it's more than just our life experiences because we're human and mortal and vulnerable. And so what don't we want to think about? Things like, yeah, I am mortal, aren't I? And I could get to go to the doctor and get a bad set of labs or a bad, you know, diagnostic exam any time, by the way, this should and could inform great passion in life and, and a commitment to loving people and telling them how much you love them and opting to spend time with them. Why? Because if we told each other the truth, we'd say, dude, 
you know, you tell me you might do it in five years, take this trip, right? Five years? Are you out of your mind? Exactly. Do you know what can happen in five years? Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. This, this is why I don't get invited to many dinner parties, because, <laughs> because <laughs> I tend to tell people, look, you, you tell me you're going to run for office and you think in four years, but you could do it now, you say, but maybe you'll do it in four years or six years. Or you could get up tomorrow morning, you, you go into the shower and you say, what's that under my arm? Yep. Now, I don't want to freak anyone out or make anyone more anxious. And you'd confront that too, just as you did. Yep. Right? Yep. And and you couldn't have, but now I bet you could say, again, you'd never sign up for it, what you went through. Right. But what, I don't want to say gifts, but what, um, no, no. They what are, they are light gifts. came out of the darkness? What yeah. uh, what light did come? What, yeah, tell me. I don't mean to turn tables on you here, but. No, there's there's a long list, man. That everything you just said is is absolutely true of my experience. I love more. I value instead of thinking about my daughter's wedding or graduation, I thought about you know the next day with her, the next moment. Um, mm. Mm. It was just powerful. The 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 lessons learned, and I I'll tell you this: this is counterintuitive, and this isn't about me, but. I want to hang on to the lessons learned, the feeling, even the emotion of the lessons learned and not those three days that were so stressful, but I started to make progress after that. I, I got a CT scan. I had some blood work done. I had surgery. I had six months of chemo. And with all mm. of those milestones, I, I began to make progress and my prognosis, I, I drove my oncologist crazy because I would ask him, <laughs> what, what's the probability now of a recurrence? And, and, and then we'd go through some more treatment. What's the possibility now? And as I made that progress, and finally, five years later, I'm back in the normal population from a risk standpoint, I want to hang on to those lessons because they're so much more powerful than just the things we learn in day-to-day -day life. So I, I would say a big uh, yes, you're right to everything you just said. And and I agree also that REM had it right. Everybody hurts. You're you're. Mm -hmm. you know, you're you're not wrong about that. It's not just some. It, it's all. I I want to. I've got this audience of young people, high school and college students, and maybe slightly older than that, and their parents. And I'm seeing something that you're kind of getting at with some of uh, your commentary today. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about them for a moment. They're often in this environment, a little more pessimistic about the future, and and I think it comes from maybe a perception that the adults in the room haven't acted in their best interest. And th these are smart young people. So they, they care about the national debt, government overreach, uh, long-term economic outlook and all that. But as a young person, and I, I know this is a, a very sort of myopic, small focused issue, but I think it's so weighty and important in that I think we put pressure on them at this age and we say things, really stupid things like the next four years will determine the, the course of the entire rest of your life. And I, I know well-meaning parents say that, well-meaning teachers say that, well-meaning advisors say that, but, and, and there's some truth to the fact that some decisions are more important than others, but that pressure just sometimes grinds them into this fear and anxiety that we're talking about. And I, I'm wondering if you could just talk about young people in the context of the future, if you would. Well, thanks. That's uh, it's a nice opportunity to do that. And really it's not that the next four, any, the next, any four years will define your entire future. First of all, so that, you know, you, it's anxiety. That's when right. parents say that they're expressing their own anxiety, like, well, you could cause me anxiety if you don't have a job. Oh, the <laughs> say, say, say that one more time. Cause that's right. I mean, that's, you're talking about the parents experiencing anxiety and transferring it to the child, to the student. Absolutely. And, you know, again, I, I wish people would let the jury stay out longer, right? Because mm -hmm. you cannot fathom, discern, uh, diagnose what's going on without taking a breath. I mean, how many people would have told Vincent Van Gogh, dude, wrap it up. Lots of them. You haven't sold a canvas. Yep. Get a job, like get a real job, <laughs> well, right? You know, sell so, cars. So true. Right. And you know, the work really that has to be done is that you can spend a long time doing something you didn't want to do because you had anxiety about it or your parents got you to feel anxious about it. And so you say, all right, I'm going to be a lawyer. 
I didn't pick that for any particular reason, although there are a lot of unhappy lawyers. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a few, <laughs> right? few friends who would agree with you. Yeah. And, and so you can do that and you, you might even be quote unquote successful at it. But as my psychiatrist told me when I was in therapy uh, and I was talking about participating in a project that um, I thought might be lucrative, um, but I really didn't care about it. Um, he said, Keith, the last place you want to be is in a first class seat on a flight going somewhere you don't want to go. Oh, that's a great analogy. <laughs> right. And, uh, and that's true. And plus, you know, the other thing is people assume that the road that they take at the beginning is the road that they're going to continue on. There are people who start as teachers and end up owning enormous education consulting companies. There are people who start as teachers and love it and they continue to teach and they're happy doing it. And their houses aren't as big as the next guy necessarily, but they're passionate about it. Mm. And th there's no money in the world that can make you want to get up and do your job, do the next thing. And there's no amount of money. The other thing is there's no amount of money that will make you feel satisfied if you're not doing your life's work. I've had billionaires, a billionaire comes to mind, who said to me of another very wealthy guy, he said, Len has real money. I said, y y wait, you don't have real money? Mm. He said, well, I, I, you know, not like Len. Isn't that right? the truth, though? So, <laughs> ne never, <laughs> never enough. It's never enough, uh, which is, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I know that that human quality of never enough has been exploited in order to create lots of jobs, you know, as people build one factory after another. So we like that in a way. We do. You know, the fact that you can buy a $300,000 watch is a curious thing. Yeah. But, but you can. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know what that, it, you know what that doesn't do? It doesn't give anybody the gift. If you're a teacher making, getting by and your kids get to see you passionate about it, it's, you're the richest woman or man on the face of the earth. Well, this just anecdotally, I, I would say this, that I encounter a lot of people who, you know, there's almost a syndrome in America in particular, uh, where we just take for granted the fact that we all look forward to Friday to the end of the day on Friday mm -hmm. and dread Monday with a passion. And there's a, I have a good friend who we, we've kind of confided in each other for most of our banking careers. And we said a couple of times, you know, when Sunday night is filled with anxiety, then it's time to rethink the path. And I, I, I think that's what you're saying here. Yeah, that's, that is definitely what I'm getting at. And, and also to be suspect of the rewards systems out there. Because yep. it yep. really feels real. It does. I mean, we have had these moments, uh, I bet both of us, I've had it, uh, where, you know, you'll be choosing the color for, you know, the tile, the better tile in your bathroom. And you think, what am I doing? <laughs> How can I be having this discussion? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Right. Exactly. Uh, actually, a friend of mine, Josh, who's a... a a journalist called me one day and we were finally putting a pool in the backyard. And he said, so you're, you're back there, huh? Did you, did you pick the color of the gunite? And I said, yeah. I said, you know, we decided to put some crushed shells in it, you know, cause it sparkles. It's an extra thousand, I think. Yep. And he said, so how do you feel? I said, I feel half, like this is fun and half like I wish they would pour the gunite over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I feel foolish back here in oh, the backyard. <laughs> I, I hear you. I, I woke up in the hospital after having colon surgery. They removed uh, 20 inches of my colon and, and, mm. and resectioned and, and everything's fine. But, but I was in the hospital for a week and on my second day, the day after the surgery, Imagine a nurse bringing in a copy of the Orlando Sentinel, and it says, "Hey, I, she said, hey, I think this is your picture here in the in the business section. Did you just sell a bank? And are you mm. are you president of this bank? And I thought about the financial implications of that sale for my family, and that you know, rewarding and and all of that. There's a there's a good feeling there, but I thought 
we would have a party that day and celebrate it incessantly. And what I what I realized, you know, with that perspective that cancer gave me is, yeah, it's it's nice, it's an accomplishment, but it's not nearly as fulfilling as I dreamed it would be. My being kind to that nurse, my being warm with my family, my focusing on doing good and and you know giving other people hope is more important than that event. And and we sold a couple of others down the road, and that experience did give me some perspective there. So I think you're you're and absolutely I, right. I th- I think I think the you know in some ways the the through line here is if you can learn to keep your eyes open during anything Mm -hmm. to never squint your eyes and say, I can't, I can't bear to look at it. Then you're going to see things that are gifts. Uh, I I do like the stoic philosophy that there's sayings like uh, the obstacle is the way, Mm -hmm. right? So what's in front of you, nothing anyone would choose for you. It was, oh my God, you know, the cells in my body are reproducing atypically. How did that even get in here? You know, that was kind of the How did that get thing. in here? Talk about having no control and a reason to be anxious and pace. Now, on the other hand, you could say, yeah, I mean, you can't, it's hard, but, but, but it's possible for human beings to say, all right, well, I'm still the master of my destiny. I'm still the director of this chaotic shit. I'm going to put my ducks in a row. I'm going to arrange my care, make sure that I, you know, access those things that are possible to access because I want to survive and I love people. I'm going to tell people I love them. I'm going to learn more about this. I'm going to keep my eyes very open for anything that might unfold to the good Mm, during this bad period. And I'm going to do that in the, again, the way the Stoics said, uh, um, love your fate, that you don't just tolerate your fate. If you can ever get here, by the way, for any of the young people who are listening, if you can ever get to the point where you say, I'm not just tolerating my fate, I'm not just afraid, I'm certainly not running away from it, I'm actually embracing it. Mm. If you were like five guys looking across the battlefield at 150 better armed people, You're not going to run. You're not going to cry and commiserate. What you're going to do is pump your fists in the air and say, at minimum, we're going to be heroes today because of the courage we show. If we win, it's for the history books. Mm, That's so good. That's so true, too. I want to change gears uh, because uh, you've been so gracious with your time. But I, I have to ask, because I've seen you comment on social media, very sophisticated social media called LinkedIn, about the discourse today on gender issues. And I'm just wondering, I don't want to get in the weeds, we don't have time, obviously, but as a mental health professional, what are your concerns at a high level about the public discourse on this topic? And it's an unfair question to to, to ask you to answer on a podcast, much less than the last few minutes. But but, uh, just talk about that for a moment, because I think, speaking of anxiety, I think a conservative Christian audience in particular is particularly concerned about how to land on these issues, how to think of them, how to be both, you find a way, I notice in your comments, to be both compassionate and loving and yet principled. And so uh, just wondering if if you'd comment on that. Well, you know, talk about a fight. I've been, uh, I've been, you know, death threats, everything else for saying what I think to be the truth, which is I don't see any evidence as a doctor, as somebody who's interested in story, you know, deeply interested in it, in analyzing things. I'm a reader. I don't see any evidence in the whole world that people are born into the wrong bodies. I just, I, if there were, I, I would be, interested. I don't see totally agreed. Right. So I don't see that. Secondly, we do know that for periods of time, kids go through stages where what did we used to call it? Oh, she's a tomboy. Well, lots of tomboys emerged as princesses. They went through a phase where they preferred to play with the guys and they weren't the ones wearing fancy dresses. And you were like, huh, um, she's a tomboy. Right now, those kids right now are at risk for some 
misguided teacher or pediatrician to say, you know, have you ever thought that maybe you're a boy? Yep. Well, listen, if you say that to an 11 year old tomboy who's looking at puberty and anxious about it and has all kinds of unfinished business in terms of like coming into her own, you can misdirect her and cause her incredible angst. And if you give her a lot of attention, or if God forbid she has a, a degree of Asperger's, so she's not comfortable with feelings to begin with, you can give somebody a quest that is so misguided. Well, I am a boy, and now I've got a reason for being. It's to become a boy, and there's so much support here for me, and it seems to be that even my teachers are confronting my parents. I wish I could confront my parents, but look at them. They're really backing my parents against the wall, and and now I've got doctors that I've got to go see, and uh, it's absolutely so irresponsible. And I think it's one of the biggest issues of our time because, frankly, we'd like to say all of us feel proud of our country, proud of our doctors, proud of science and the truth and religion. But, you know, the truth is they must be pointing fingers at us over like in the Taliban and saying, Mm -hmm. do you know what? They bring their 10 and 11 year olds sometimes to hospitals and they inject them with opposite sex hormones to stop puberty. And then they prepare them for surgery to do a double mastectomy. Yep. What? Like what kind of country is that? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, not not to mention all of, uh, you know, you've said the word truth uh, 15 times or so in this conversation and, we do have a philosophical bent now to say something like uh, objective truth is, is more of a social construct. Uh, it doesn't exist. And, and so the truth becomes my truth and your hmm. truth and so on. And I think that's connected well, to this, this dysphoria that you're talking about. I was once called and my, my son who played hockey for a local high school, you know, they once had a, a compulsory gathering, the entire student body. They brought in a woman who was now a man. Right. And that person said to the entire student body, hey, close your eyes. And I want you to think about what gender you really are, not the body you were born into. What? Mm. And I had to go into the school because the headmaster called me and he said, hey, your son, he uh, rolled his eyes and he didn't close his eyes. He rolled his eyes when when he was told that. And he kind of threw up his hands like, what? That was rude, he said. Mm. I said, well, do you have, where's the binder that you have, by the way? It took me an hour to get here. You probably put together a binder. He said, I'm sorry, what? I said, the big black binder. He said, I I don't understand. I said, well, you must have a binder with all the studies, the science, about how adolescent or teenage boys respond when you suggest they might want to be castrated. (laughs) And he said, well, why do you put it that way? I said, I'm being, what? Because it, it, it? it's, it's true. Because <laughs> it's the truth. So he said, and actually, believe it or not, he said, it seems to me, Dr. Avlo, that if we sent your son home and he sincerely said, Dad, I want to be female, you'd be upset. I said, I'd rather you send him home with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, we could fight that together. Mm. We would be likely to win, but you'd be consigning us to hell for no good reason. And I know you don't believe me, but in the end, the science will show that this was all a misadventure. And it was one way that ultra liberal, misguided philosophies were cleaving people from themselves. Mm. Get high, wonder what gender you are. Don't go to work. We'll send you a check. Just don't vie for any power, and we're good with you. That's the message young people are getting, and they shouldn't buy it no matter what. Yeah, you're, you're preaching now to the choir, and <laughs> I, I'm thankful that you take a, a stand for truth. That's, that's exactly right. And at the same time, I would imagine you were kind and courteous to this guy who, who was misguided uh, in his effort to try to lead the school 
Sure. Uh, and, you know, you can, we can still salvage relationships when we disagree, but this issue, it seems to me, is clear. And I think you're absolutely right. And I can only imagine I'll get some mail from, <laughs> from, from this. I talked about critical race theory a few episodes ago, and I did it in a kind, loving way but kind of talked about the weakness in the whole Black Lives Matter movement. So I've experienced just a little bit of that. You know, one of the, one of the things, uh, it, is, it is such an honor to have you here. And one of the things that occurs to me is with so much of life, this podcast takes me out of my comfort zone. It takes me out of my lane. And I've stayed in my lane most of my career. And it is students urging that kind of push me to do this. And so you've given me good personal advice here. And I know our, our listeners will benefit from uh, this conversation because I think we're all afraid of some things and even success and failure when we when we stretch outside of our comfort zone. So thank you for being here. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm assuming that KeithAblo.com is the best way for listeners to find you and, and uh, communicate with you if they choose to. It is. Yeah, KeithAblo.com. And uh, again, you know, my job in this world is to try to help people find themselves in whatever way they want to. And uh, so that's uh, that's how you find me. Well, uh, this, I feel this, very privileged to do that work. Well, this this has been uh, on a scale of one to ten. This is a ten. Uh, and I, I, uh, I, thank I, you, I really, buddy. I really appreciate it. Our our guest today has been Dr. Keith Ablo. I hope you've enjoyed his wisdom and discernment as much as I have. Please go to johnwarrenmedia.com for more information about our work. And until next time. Thanks for listening to Relentless Truth with John Warren. Please consider sharing this podcast and subscribe to receive future episodes. Connect with John regarding your comments, questions, and show ideas through johnwarrenmedia.com or at John Warren Media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. That's all for this episode. Join us next week for another edition of Relentless Truth with John Warren. Music